COVID-19 prevention in school settings. COVID-19 is mostly spread by respiratory droplets released when people talk, cough, or sneeze. It is thought that the virus may also be spread to hands through contaminated surfaces, then to the nose or the mouth, causing the infection to enter the body. Therefore, personal prevention practices, such as hand washing, staying home when feeling sick, and environmental cleaning and disinfection are important principles that will be covered within this video. According to the CDC, the more people a student or staff member interacts with, and the longer that interaction occurs, then the higher the risk of the COVID-19 spreading. For schools reopening, the CDC describes three risk stages. Lowest risk, students and teachers will engage in virtual only classes, activities, and events. More risk, students and teachers will engage in small in-person classes, activities, and events. Groups of students will stay together and with the same teacher throughout and across school days. Groups will not mix and students will remain at least six feet apart while not sharing commonly used objects. The highest risk, students and staff will return to fully sized in-person classes, activities, and events. Students will not be spaced apart. They will share classroom materials and supplies and they will mix between classes and activities. The CDC has encouraged the implementation of several strategies to help reduce the spread of the COVID-19. Reducing close contact as much as possible, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, such as the teaching and reinforcement of hand washing for at least 20 seconds with soap and water, as well as the increased monitoring to ensure adherence among not only students, but also staff. The encouragement of staff and students to cover their coughs and sneezes with tissues. Once finished, that tissue should be thrown in the trash and hands washed immediately with soap and water. If soap and water are not readily available, then the use of hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% of alcohol can be used. The use of face coverings. Face coverings should be worn not only by students, but also as staff as feasible. These can be essential in times when physical distance is difficult. Throughout the school day, staff should be reminding students to not touch their face coverings and the proper use as well as how to properly wear a face mask. This can also be done by giving parents and guardians proper instructions for cleaning face masks. We can help support healthy hygiene behaviors by providing students and staff with adequate supplies, including but not limited to soap, hand sanitizer, paper towels, disinfectant wipes, extra face masks, and the new implementation of no touch trash cans. According to the CDC, they recommend daily environmental cleaning and disinfection be done to frequently touch surfaces. This can include, but it's not limited to, doorknobs, water fountains, desk, bathroom surfaces, and gym equipment. Signs reminding students of hand hygiene, coughing techniques, and face covering should be visible throughout school campuses. This will promote everyday protective measurements, as well as weekly updates and announcements should be given to parents via email calls or social media. Once a school district has decided to reopen, there are several strategies that they can do to maintain a healthy environment. These include, but are not limited to, the cleaning and disinfectant of frequently touched services within school and on school buses. This can be done daily or between uses as much as possible, and including implementing cleaning schedules. The use of shared objects should be limited when possible and clean between uses. We should discourage the use of shared of sharing difficult to clean items. Keep children's supplies separated and labeled. Avoid sharing electronic devices, toys, books, games, or other learning aids, all while keeping in mind that as the staff needs to clean, they need to keep cleaning products away from children. The prevention of inhalation toxins is the most important. We also need to ensure ventilation systems operate properly. We can increase circulation of outdoor air as well and as much as possible. You can achieve this by opening windows and doors unless they pose a safety or health risk to the children or the facility. Um, the next thing they were talking about is physical barriers uh, that help to reduce the transmission and encourage the physical distancing. That also not only includes the plexiglass that we're seeing in stores and shops now, but also the directionals on the floor to keep the people flowing in one direction, uh, markers on the floor to stand here six feet apart, um, there's even some schools that have put sneeze and cough guards around the desks. And here you'll see pictures of those things right now.
The other thing they were discussing was the spacing of desks, the physical distance of the students at the tables or chairs, um, seating arrangements on buses, and you know that comes with a different set of problems. Additionally, is now you need bigger spaces, you need more buses, um, or scheduling and staggering things. Um, you know, in the next picture you're going to see is the classroom lockers in a certain school, and they're right on top of each other. They're within inches. So if they don't stagger, everybody's going to be at the locker shoulder to shoulder. Again, that's against what the recommendation is for social distancing. The other thing they were talking about was food service in the schools. Um, the best recommendation they had was for everybody to bring their own food. The next best would be to have pre-packed or individualized meals served in the classroom. Both of those were recommended in classrooms not to go to a cafeteria where you're going to have a larger group of students and faculty congregating. Um, you use disposable utensils, dishes, if that's not possible. Um, they need to really monitor the safe handling and sanitization of those products. They also talked about the prevention, making sure all sinks um, have running water, proper amounts of soap and disposable paper towels, recommending foot pedaled uh, waste bins so that you don't actually have to lift the lid or touch the lid um, because as each person touches it, you're increasing the risk of contamination and cross-contamination. Um, adequate amounts of hand sanitizer, disinfecting wipes, tissues and face coverings. Um, they did put a little bit of a warning out for the hand sanitizer and disinfecting wipes with the younger kids. Um, they need to be a little bit more monitored for proper and safe use. And they also talked about another thing of prevention was signs, put signs up, wash your hands, proper sneezing etiquette, proper coughing etiquette, how to wash your hands. Um, they also recommended that the school pick like one person as a contact person for um, all of the COVID issues, whether it's reporting the child sick, that reporting the child was found sick at school, um, family or friends that need to find out how to do things, the staff, if they have found out that they've been exposed or have a test positive or just are sick and should not show up, who all of this needs to go through. Because when you have one appoint, everybody knows where to get information. They're getting the same information. Um, and that's probably the best way that they say to handle that. Next, the CDC actually gave a little bit of rationale why people are trying and wanting and believing that schools need to reopen. Um, you know, the schools provide structure and safety for children they provide a routine, regularity, um, but it also benefits the families, friends, and community local to them as well. Um, in terms of economics, they're going back to work. Um, but the real benefit is to the children's education, not only their uh, academics, but their emotional growth and development. Uh, works well with helping for emotional well-being, mental health issues, um, development of language, communication, and social interpersonal skills. Uh, many schools offer psychological counseling, therapies, um, supervision. Uh, they address the behavioral issues in schools. They have things called IEPs, Individualized Education Plans, for children who have behavioral difficulties. Um, they also provide assessments, medical, mental health assessments. They also monitor. Um, schools are mandated reporters, so if there's any sort of neglect or abuse at the home, that may be caught in a school and it is going to be mandated to be reported. Um, there's also the issue of children who are disabled, may not be able to learn at home um, or online. They have either the disability is a problem or they don't have internet, they don't have a computer, they don't have access. Um, so that would also be another reason why in-person schooling is the recommendation. There's other children who also don't have enough food. They provide school lunch programs, school breakfast programs, and for some of the children in the schools that may be what they get to eat for that day. Um, so they really do you know, rely on these the schools a lot more for than just academics. Um, so having said all this, um, we don't, we're not going to make a recommendation as to whether people should or should not go back to school. I think there's some issues with how to implement the guidelines. Um, as far as logistics, uh, the parents also need to evaluate how much risk they believe that the child will have, as well as who's in the home, um, and what kind of risk that 
brings to them.